Hey, it's Phil. Welcome back to the podcast. I am here with Sky Jatani. Hi. Who's eating oranges? Yep. Are those tangelos? Those are clementines. clementines. Yeah, something like that. Cuties, they call them. Cuties, sweet, sweet clementine. Right. And Christian Taylor, hey. who is pretty in fuchsia. Because it's Valentine's oh, Day. Oh, this is our Valentine's episode. Okay. Although and this is going to air after Valentine's Day. It is. Day. But we oh. can still oh, say close. Happy Valentine's Day happy to Valentine's our listeners Day. that we love. So that's why we're going to take the next hour to tell you the history of St. Valentine. <laughs> Not. No, I, I don't even know who he is. You could sing a us a love it. song. <laughs> you have a book about St. Valentine? Mm-hmm. Why? You really want to know? Yeah. yeah. When, it's, when each of my children was born, I bought them a children's book while they were still in the hospital, and I wrote yeah. a note to them at the front of the book. And my yeah. daughter, Lucy, her birthday's in February, so I got her. And each of the, the children's books is about a, a Christian saint or somebody, oh, okay. you know, whatever. So hers is about St. Valentine. Really? Yeah. Wow. Why didn't you name her Valentine? Because that, that was a name, right? Yeah, but it's that a boy's was... name. Oh, it, oh. Okay. Saint Valentine was a boy. He was a doctor, actually. Saint. As is Valentino. Valentino. Mm-hmm. That's a version of what, Valentina. You should have named her Valentina. Oh yeah, that would have been cute. Call her Tina. Call her Tina. <laughs> mm-hmm. Hindsight's twenty twenty. Tina Gitani. It's Val. a very Italian kind of thing. Right? <laughs> Tina Gitani. Okay. Hey, it's a podcast. What do you know? Hey, it's a podcast. Hey, we got video. Hey, it's a podcast. So in here, the Phil Fisher podcast starts right here. We'll talk to Sky. Hey. <laughs> and Christian too. Hey. <laughs> and we don't have a guest, not even my dog buddy here for you. Oh, that makes me sad. I know he's at home. And he's a cockapoo for those of you that asked. Hey, it's a podcast. So let it air. The Phil Vischer Podcast starts right here. The Phil Vischer Podcast starts right here. I always want to hit the high note when you go there. I love to hit the high note. And I usually miss it. I miss it about 50% of the time. Because <laughs> the frets, the, the high frets on a ukulele are tiny, tiny, tiny little frets. I, They're hard to hit. I believe you. They're hard to hit. Um, what are we talking about? You're going to be gone for the next three weeks. I am. you got to figure out. I'm having a see if Drew can major in. back surgery. You're having back surgery. Yeah, that's why I'm always, if you're wondering, shifting in my yeah, seat and I can't sit still. Yeah, my back's not happy. We need to get you one of those donuts to sit on. <laughs> that may help. <laughs> okay. Uh, so three Christian's weeks not going to be ish. here for the next three weeks. We'll have to figure something out. Uh, we'll have Buddy. We'll have Buddy. Yes. See if he <laughs> Buddy would be awesome. It. We just got to cut to Buddy, and then you can do a voice for him. Uh-huh. And, uh-huh. I'm sure he has about as much to say then, or then think as I do. his opinions might closely resemble my own. No, they would resemble more like mine. It could be your alter ego. <laughs> oh, you Very to, simple dog I to, thoughts. I have to make him think like Christian. I yes. think we know that Buddy's an atheist. <laughs> hey, he's God spelled backwards. <laughs> dog? Yeah. yeah. Why Buddy? Is it named after the elf? Why Buddy? Um, I don't know. The funny thing was we had another dog when we got him who was getting old, and his name was Kirby, uh, named after, I believe, believe Kirby Puckett, because Lisa grew up in Minnesota, and he was the most popular Minnesota twin. And then we, and but I always called Kirby Buddy. I said, come here, buddy. I mm-hmm. called Kirby because he was my little buddy. Mm-hmm. And then we got another dog, and, and somehow Lisa picked the name Buddy, and it really messed me up. <laughs> so then I had to start. Come here, buddy, buddy. Yeah. We <laughs> named our dog after a burger restaurant. We named our dog after... McDonald's? Your, your dog no. McDonald's? Alfie. Alfie. Oh, Alfie, right, no. after Alfie's in. I got a name for our next dog, but I don't think anybody in my house agrees with me. What is it? I want to name him Al Puccino. Puccino. <laughs> that's... Yeah. I don't think that's... Odd. Gonna, I think it'd be great. I don't and you'd call him what? Pooch? Happen. Al? <laughs> Pooch? Puccino? How many different names can a dog hold in his head and respond to successfully? It's all in the tone. I it's will say the, that my uh, son tells our dog Black Ninja, and that's his cue for going to the bathroom. So it really doesn't matter what you say. That's right. It's just Black Ninja makes your dog go to the bathroom. Apparently. Wow. He didn't response. want to say go potty, so he just said Black Ninja. <laughs> wow. Okay. Uh, crazy stuff is going on. What? As always. This week. Uh, well, you heard about the triple murder in North Carolina. Uh, that one that, missed me. Yeah, that, but that's still. What not happened? Clear, right? No, it is not clear. Uh, one of our one of our listeners sent in said you got to cover this story because people aren't outraged. Um, well, three uh, Muslim students. Oh, that one. Yes, were basically executed, shot in the head. Yeah, uh, mm. one bullet to the head of each in, over a parking in, spot. Well, that's what the police say. The police say it was a parking 
nothing. Dispute. The uh, shooter is an older white male. And he turned himself in. He who turned himself in. His last name is Hick. He's an atheist. Right. He's an avowed atheist. Okay. And he doesn't like religion. So the the Muslim community is saying, <clears throat> don't you think that was a hate crime? The police are saying, that was about parking spot. Well, what what difference does it Either way, make? It's horrible. Yeah, because it is so horrible. Well, and yeah, they're and, not and here. the Muslim community is all saying, well, why would you execute three people? How could a parking dispute go hey, to that level? This is America. I guess. Worst things have, have happened. Have you seen sadly. what happens in Chicago if somebody <laughs> takes the chairs that you're you know, yeah. your dibs. Yeah, yeah, your dibs for the snow people don't get shoveled killed. Lot. People don't get killed. Yeah, this, this one feels like more of the story is yet to come out. Yeah, a and spokesman for the Council on American Islamic Relations says, I find it hard to believe a parking dispute alone would result in an execution style murder of three people. There has to be other factors involved. What, 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 when you kill someone, when you do something horrific and then you turn yourself in as opposed to Running. running or killing yourself, mm -hmm. which other people who do horrific things and they don't want to pay the price, so they just, I'm going down with them. But to, to turn, turn yourself in, to me, that's always implied more that you went, whoa, what did I just do? I got to come clean. Or that you're turning yourself in because you're making a statement. Really? Like, so then he's going to get in court. It's and sort of say, like when a, when a group executes some kind of terrorist act and then they immediately they take, take credit. credit for it. It's like, yeah, because we were making a statement and we want to be associated with that statement. So what's his statement? I don't know in this case. Right. There's that's no what statement. I'm saying. I don't, we we're don't know what's statement. going on here. And it may well have been racially or religiously motivated. It could have would, just been he, he completely lost his mind about this parking. Who knows? Would, it, would the punishment be different one way or the other? I don't know. If it was over a parking space or if it was... Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. Hate crime is a higher level. Okay. Of I've never... I, I'm going to maybe bother some of our listeners in, with this, but I've yeah. I've really never quite understood the whole hate crime Yeah, thing. why it's Because worse. murder well, inherently is hateful. Right. Yeah, but I think... I don't think... What motivates you I don't you think to, it's as, it makes that as much of a difference on that end of the spectrum. I think it's more if, you know, kids paint a swastika on your garage door right. versus just painting, you know, hey, you're graffiti. funny looking right. on your garage door. Okay, fine. Door. If there, that's if, but that's crime. when you're on the level of murder. Yeah. If I murder you because you took my parking spot or I murder you because I don't like your race or your religion, yeah. Does it, should the law really take that into account when determining right. your... Your sentence? Well, I wanted I wanted his uh, money, so that's less bad. Right, right. So I killed him. Yeah, that's why I don't. I don't. Well, and my get point it. is, like you know, you've got three people who are now no longer here, yeah. and so his punishment already is going to be beyond anything he can serve. I'm right, sure. Right. So it's e easily a lifetime sentence, right? Regardless. So I think it's probably unless more he's crazy. In unless he's going to say, "I turned myself in because I'm." mentally unstable and I came to and realized I'd done a terrible thing. Can I just go to a really nice uh, asylum on in the Caribbean? I mean, I think the one life? thing that it would be good for is an as a less object lesson for sure. Let's say he did come forward and say, yeah, you know, it, it is, you know, they did make me mad because of who they are, or how they live or how they worship. Um, you know, talking about that kind of anger and hatred, what it would lead to, I think, would be an important conversation to have. But Yeah. Hicks was an avowed atheist whose Facebook comments bore at least some grudges against religion. Last month, he posted a photo that says, Praying is pointless, useless, narcissistic, arrogant, and lazy, just like the imaginary God you pray to. But that's a pretty blanket indictment of religion, not just Islam. Yeah, right. And that's, I do, I do want, because some people have pointed out that the, uh, in the in the uh, atheist community, the the rhetoric against Muslim is heating up. You know, Bill right. Maher, Be Sam Harris, etc. Right. Because what's going on in in the Middle East and other terrorist yes. attacks seem to, for them, epitomize what's wrong with religion in yes. general. And people don't want to speak up about it. So mm -hmm. we're going to speak up about it in in a big way. So then there's always the question when when leaders get more aggressive. You know they're not going to do anything terrible, but the lunatic fringe of their followers. Mm -hmm. You know, and the same thing happened with with um, abortion clinic bombings. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, no mainstream pro life organization said we're going to go bomb abortion clinics, but the rhetoric against abortion got mm -hmm. so heated that the lunatic fringe around the movement 
took matters into their own hands. Does every movement have a lunatic fringe? Is that just part of being a movement? If it's a big enough, well, little movements. Well, we have a lot of lunatics, oh. so I would think <laughs> that just about anything. I don't know. What scares me more are the lunatics that are at the center of some movements. Yeah, when a lunatic gets to the middle, yeah. that's when you, you get Nazism right. instead of just a, a guy running around with a handgun in a parking lot with you know no pants on. Right. Which happens almost well, every regardless, weekend it's here. very heartbreaking. But isn't yeah. that part of the bigger conversation we're all having right now is... is uh, if every movement has a lunatic fringe, but the fringe becomes associated with the whole movement, right. then you're in trouble. And that's what's happening in Islam right now, where right. people are saying, well, right. well ISIS happens. is just a lunatic fringe, and others say, no, 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 this no, is Islam. This is, this is a, the right. core, this is where it naturally leads to. But the right. same thing is true of Christianity. You know, they look at the crazy uncles and say, this is exactly why we need to get rid of all religion, because then we're anti-science and anti-vaccinations and anti, you mm -hmm. know, whatever. We only have one book. We end up, we only have one book. Oh, so, some people asked why Ken Ham is coming up so much on the podcast, because he came up in two weeks in a row. And uh, that was not intentional. Here's the deal with Ken Ham and why he's coming up more in the podcast, because he has uh, worked fairly hard over the last year to make himself a national figure. And because of the Bill Nye debate, he succeeded and has become a national figure. And so in my news feeds, he's coming up a lot more than two years ago because he's gotten he's raised his own profile. This is actually what he was working towards, and it's worked. So th the story I did last week, about Ken Ham criticizing the Carnival Cruise Line commercials um, wasn't me reading Ken Ham's blog and saying, oh, he's saying something, I'm going to comment about it. It was actually in The Hollywood Reporter. So The Hollywood Reporter was commenting on Ken Ham's blog. That means The Hollywood Reporter has never commented on my blog or my podcast or anything that I've ever done except the Jonah movie, I think, and I don't remember if they liked it or not. Um, because I, I have not achieved the level of national attention that Ken Ham has now successfully achieved this year. This puts him in the news more, which puts him in my news feeds more, which puts him on the podcast more. Okay? Ta-da! Ta-da! Okay. Um, new study from uh, Lifeway Research, which is a little bit, a little, well, it's very interesting and I think a little bit disturbing. 27% of Americans say the Islamic State represents true Islam. Uh, and um, even more uh, surprising, almost half of senior Protestant pastors, of Protestant senior pastors, say that the Islamic State is a true representation of Islamic society. Okay, may half, I ask... 50%. 47% of Protestant senior pastors believe the Islamic State is an accurate representation of Islamic society. I think the next question should be, how many of you have traveled to an Islamic society? Or how do you know? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I have a question. Yes, Christian. To start off this. Yes, Christian. All right. Okay. So what I wonder, what I have heard, yes. again, I am not an expert at this at all, so this is why I'm asking But you've questions. heard something. I have heard things. Yeah. yeah. One of the things was it, I have... Was it on the internet? It's all... It was probably from <laughs> friends, Christian friends who have the read the, who have read the Quran. On Facebook. Actually, it's two of my family members, uh -oh. I have to be honest. It's getting close. I uh -oh. didn't want to uh -oh. out them, but uh -oh. it's true. Now you've gone too far. <laughs> People will start narrowing it down. But the mantra that I hear is, if you really get back to the basis of Islam, and yeah. if you read the Quran, then what truly is at the heart of it is you do have to kill all the infidels. Mm. And so... You know that. I don't think. So that's I'm accurate. asking you, what? What? Me? <laughs> or you? Because I look the most like. No, a Muslim? no, no. I'm not. Ra I'm not racially profiling you. Or because I I've just... read the Quran. <laughs> Haven't you? Yeah. Yeah, that's why I'm asking you. Did it tell you to kill all the infidels? You know, this has been a long time. I spent a year studying Islam as an undergrad. Oh, hey, you're our resident expert. It's been a long time. Tell us, Scott. Hey, what old. does you're the Quran say about well, killing people? Here's the thing. If, if you want to justify that, yes, you can find surahs or verses of the Quran that would justify that. But Does that, surah mean verse? Yeah, essentially. Okay. Uh, but I think you could, you could make an argument that you could do the same thing with the Bible. 
Not the New Testament. Not the New Testament. Well, is it true that the later things in the Quran, those are the ones that trump the earlier things in the Quran, and that later in the Quran is well, where here's it the problem. Talks about you that? have the Quran. <laughs> Why are you giggling? Because <laughs> you've hijacked my show. I'm sorry. I had a show. You have the Quran, but then you also have the Hadith, plus you have Sharia law, plus you have just like in in um, ancient Judaism, you have all of the. Islamic scholarly commentators, um, teachers who interpret Islam, and so that's why you have Wahhabism as one form. And so there's, it's a very diverse, you have Sufism, which is a more mystical form of Islam. So there's all these diverse streams of Islamic belief, depending on who's interpreted it, what source they're really going to. What, so you can't say this is what Islam says, just like you can't say this is what all Christians think all the time. Because there, That's true. <laughs> there's Roman Catholics, there's Protestants, there's militant, there's the KKK, which some people would say is Christian, and all of us would go, no way, no, it's not. Mm-hmm. So there's Westboro Baptist, which we right. all say isn't Christian, except they maintain, well, so, even the Church of Latter-day Saints. Exactly. Say, yeah, we're Christian, we right. follow the Bible. But then there'd and, be other Christians say, no, you don't, no, because you, you don't, don't believe in it. So same thing, the same thing in Islam. Right. There's so many different streams. You can't just say that the Islamic State represents Islam. It represents one wacky stream of Islam, for sure, but you cannot, it's not a monolithic, simple uh, and there, and I, I don't tradition. And I don't think that the terror practices are justifiable Quranically. I mean, it, there's because the, the punishments are are more. The state should do this. The, this is yeah. The, I, I it's, I'm yeah. not. You, you didn't prepare me for well, this before did, the what yeah. about before the, the show. Are, but, uh, why yeah. are the pastors saying then that that or what do they mean when they say? <laughs> let's ask. What do they mean when I, they say? I don't think they know what they mean. Okay. To be honest, I mean, how how many of these pastors have studied the Quran or are. Guess or have been know. to an Islamic society, like yeah. I said. I think what they're repeating is what's becoming a popular perception in America. Which is? Which is most Americans have zero experience with Islam or with Muslims. The only vision they do have of it is what's reported on the news. And they go, well, there, there you go. That must be Islam. So it's violent because I saw violence on the news. Okay. And then, you know, they'd never go to Indonesia. Is, is Indonesia it's very Muslim. Most, the largest, most populous yeah. uh, Islamic there are there are Islamic terrorists. Was it that that group uh, in Indonesia? There was a group. Yeah, there is a yeah. It's named after a tiger or something, isn't there? A tiger group. I think you're thinking of Katy Perry. <laughs> oah, it's back she to was Katie riding Perry. a lion. Oh right, an Islamic lion. <laughs> but she was singing about tell. tigers. I couldn't tell. Do you know? Oh. Do you know that the lion, the 16 foot lion that Katy Perry rode, was built by the same guy who built the Veggie Tales suits for Veggies Live on stage. And Is how that did you right? Find that out? How did you find that out? My friend Paul Conrad oh. sent me an article because he worked with with that group. It's it's uh, uh, Curry Design. They also did in the Winter Olympics in Salt Lake City the giant oh. T Rex head that came over the side of the stadium. They, big, they do wow. large scale, and they also did all the. Did they do the Lion King too? Yeah, he did all the puppets for the Lion King. Those were cool too. So oh, the, yeah, the Broadway looks, show. The it Broadway looks similar. Show. The Broadway, not the animated one. Right. No, the animated one did not have there were no puppets. Many puppets <laughs> in it. Okay, okay. So it is concerning that that many senior pastors have come to that conclusion, probably without a lot of study. I don't think they've all. Uh, oh, I got a text from my wife. Hang on, I'll be right back. No, I, I, I can't read that right now. It is a little concerning. Um, the pastors had a much darker view of Islam than Americans at large. Only 27% of Americans say the Islamic State reflects the true nature you, of you, Islamic society. Do you think this is a case of, of exploiting a competitive advantage? What do you mean by that? I mean, they want to. They want. They want to make Islam look they bad. They want the competitor to look worse. Yeah, I'm sure there's a little bit of that. Yeah, if you if your job is to win the argument that Christianity is the better way, yeah. then you're gonna grab. And I find myself tempted to do this when I when something bad happens. You know, an atheist does something bad. Mm-hmm. Uh, a Muslim does something bad. It's tempting to say, "See, that's why my team is the right team." Right. That's you know, and then a Christian does something bad, and I'm very confused. Well, and part of it, I wonder. If part of it is in the last however many decades you want to put this out. Uh, 
there's been a lot of negative press around Christianity. And, you know, Christians are homophobic and Christians are anti-science and Christians are this and Christians are that. But you know what we're not doing is killing cartoonists and right. and burning people alive and all that. So when another right. religious group fringe is doing that, we can go, well, hey, you know, those are the bad yeah, guys. Right. We're, we're right. the good team here. We're, so we're, we're making ourselves look better by I have a newsflash. God looks at everybody the same, no matter what the sin is. <laughs> but does he look at all religions the same? I think so. Hmm? You think God approves of all religions? No, not approves. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't say approve. Oh, wow. I didn't this say This is approve. why Christian will be taking a leave of absence. <laughs> we almost <laughs> lost a couple I of weeks. I did not say approve. We're going to be hanging out with Looks Brian Williams. people the same. People. Not beliefs. I think religion is a man-made system of a way to worship the divine. Okay. <laughs> and so I think... Are you quoting from with... No, no, is that what it said? No. But you, <laughs> and that's that, my that, own that. thought. It's my own original thought. <laughs> Believe it or not, I have them. 61% of senior pastors disagree with the statement, true Islam creates a peaceful society. 50% of African-American pastors say Islam can create a peaceful society, while only 30% of white pastors agree with that statement. Oh, that's interesting. That's interesting. So we have a race gap. Now, do you think that's the influence of Islam in African-American culture? Vis a vis well, Louis Farrakhan. Well, that's not Islam, etc. That's the nation of Islam. Yeah, I, well, it's a it's a derivative. Not to be it's confused offshoot, with the Islamic State, but it's closely associated. But but it's closely associated with the um, the African American movement yeah. and and the civil and if you're people movement. like me, you wouldn't know the difference B- between African Americans and Arabs. Between the nation of Islam <laughs> and Islamic State, oh, you know what I'm saying? Like the nation of oh, nation of Islam is Louis Farrakhan. I know, it's, I know that, but how well, is well, what you, he, you do know the difference. How is what he believes oh. different than... He, he hasn't beheaded very many people. Okay. So it's not radical Islam, but it's... It's, it's a different... It's a whole different thing. Yeah, I'm, I'm in thing. no place to comment okay. on the yeah. teachings yeah. of the okay. Nation of Islam, except that... It, I mean, when you go back and watch the Malcolm X movie, yeah. which was a really good movie, yeah. um, there's a sense of it's, it's a... At least back then, it was a black supremacy group to counter the white supremacy supremacists that were... And they just named themselves the Nation of Islam? Well, the argument that Farrakhan made was that it, it, Christianity is a white person's religion and Islam is more of a brown and black person's religion, and so yeah. we should latch onto what's indigenous right. to our... so reject the white religion right. and accept the brown religion. Right. Okay. What, what's kind of interesting here is, is just the gap between senior pastors and the general public. There was another study... In, in the South, I think in, in Mississippi, someplace it was very anti-gay marriage, that pastors were actually more favorably disposed towards gay marriage and gay rights than their people. But that, was the, that include like mainline denominations? Because that would make sense. Yeah, but so does this. It does? Yeah, so does oh. this. This is mainline and evangelical. Protestant, though. Pro- right. uh, all Protestant. Right. Yeah, Catholics, they won't do surveys th- unless the Pope says it's okay. Oh. <laughs> Stop. I'm kidding. Uh, I don't know why they didn't survey Catholics. Is it, you know, I don't. You know, I don't know. So you think the gap so is it, ra- the racial divide is because no, no, not the racial divide. The gap between the laity and the clergy. Okay, is interesting because in in gay marriage, it seems to be that the clergy is more progressive and the laity more conservative. At least in the deep south, right? Uh, in terms of views of Islam. The laity is more progressive and the clergy more conservative. Isn't that interesting? It is, and that's why I wonder. Analyze it, Scott. Well, no, that's why Analyze I asked the question. Is this a, about a, com- a competitive advantage? Probably. They're trying to Could be. win more converts or more people into their churches, and so they want to believe that these other religious traditions are inherently... Bad. Speaking of religious people doing bad things, it's not just the Muslims. Uh-oh. Sure? Tens of thousands of Muslims flee Christian militias in Central African Republic. Ooh, that doesn't sound good. Several, uh, several listeners have sent in this story. In towns and villages, as well as here in the capital, Christian vigilantes wielding machetes have killed scores of Muslims who are, my, who are a minority here and burned and looted their houses and mosques. I do in not like that. recent days, according to witnesses, aid agencies, and peacekeepers, tens of thousands of Muslims Terrible. have fled their homes. 
Uh, so are they real Christians? <laughs> see, well, that's and that's exactly what the Muslims say about the Islamic State. Say they're not real Muslims because they're not behaving well, and then we say they're not real Christians because they're not behaving well. Well, if they really were following it's, the teachings of Christ, they wouldn't be murdering hard, people. It is hard to say I am a follower of Jesus, and that is why I am hacking you to death with <laughs> exactly. a machete. Well, that was what's so disturbing back in was machete. it ninety four? Was that the Rwandan genocide? Yes. The Tutsis and right. the Hutus and all that. The, Rwanda at the time was one of the most Christian countries in the world. Over 90% of the population of Rwanda identified as Christian. And mm. yet it was one of the worst genocides of the 20th century. Mm. What and is the horror. world I mean, coming so to? So you can't, yeah, these labels at some level break down and you go, really? Can we just move beyond this? When you, when you dig under the story a little bit, um, it, is a, it is groups of Christians that are... Uh, doing revenge killings on Muslims. Because Jesus didn't have anything to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. Yeah. <clears throat> and and it basically, a Christian militias formed to defend churches and homes against the attacks of Muslims. Well, were these, uh, were they being attacked first? Who? The Christians that killed all these people. Well, it was a question of who hit who first. It goes round and Did round. Did you and hit round. me first? That's, it's, I don't know. But there, so it's not just. Um, it's not just Muslims doing, so your point doing is, bad things. My point is is that you can build a lot of different cases depending on which stories you read in the news. And in many places on earth, Christian or Muslim is more of a tribal identity than an actual you know, way of life. It's, it's, it's a tribe. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, when, and particularly because, you know, like the Middle East, Africa is an... It was is a place that was cut up by Europeans. It wasn't, you know, all the borders were made by Europeans. Say, so you live in Chad. <laughs> it's like I do. I don't. I, and they have no national identity. It's tribal identity. So Africa was entirely tribal. And then you throw in Christianity, and many people embrace that as, well, it's my new tribe. My new tribe is Christian, and my tribal friends are being attacked by that tribe, so I'm going to go attack them back. The same thing happened in Europe in in the Middle Ages, which actually led to the Crusades being worse than they were. And the reason was because of the the European belief in vendetta, which predated Christianity. And and vendetta, was if someone does something to your family, you have an obligation to do it to their family. You have an obligation. It's the premise of the Godfather movies. Yeah, that's right. (laughs) <laughs> I gotta do to you what you did to me. Yeah, you watch out, or I'll send Tina Valentino yeah, to Tina you. Tina Valentino <laughs> is gonna take your horse and just chop out the. Are you trying to be Marlon Brando? I don't know what I'm trying to be. <laughs> I'm trying to be ridiculous. So uh, and so that made the Crusades worse because what the Pope didn't realize at the time when he said, "Hey, let's pull together an army. Everybody who wants to go free Jerusalem, go do it," not realizing how much pent up anger there was because of the sense of vendetta, you know, and and so people viewed uh, Jerusalem as Christ's um, inheritance. Like, well, this, that Jerusalem belongs to Jesus. They took it from him, so they have offended my family, you know, and that's why there was much more violence when, Hmm. when, and brutality when it actually, they released the floodgates and they actually got to Jerusalem and they killed so many Muslims that, you know, on the Temple Mount, the blood was up to your ankles, they estimated, from just slaughtering Muslims because they were paying back the price. It was vendetta. Wow. Which is not in the Bible. And they don't tell this in my history class. Do you take a history class Well, nowadays? No, I'm just thinking back to when I did, which I guess is a pretty long time ago. <laughs> now, okay. okay, but not only can everyone come up with violence <laughs> if they really, really want to, everyone can come up with crazy uncles. Okay, well, who's our latest? <laughs> if they really, really want to. Some uh, atheists are concerned that Richard Dawkins is moving into the category of crazy uncle. Uh, Rich- it, just more evidence that it's officially now a religion. Crazy uncle is a religion? No, atheism. <laughs> they have their own crazy uncles. Oh, yes. Uh, this is an article. This was in the London Telegraph, um, written by Tim Stanley. Richard Dawkins' insanity has now become an English institution, like warm beer and rain. 
On Saturday morning... <laughs> I like that. On Saturday morning, a tweet from his account asked why we don't send lots of, quote, erotic videos, unquote, to theocracies, adding that it should be loving, gentle, woman-respecting videos. <laughs> Honestly, when does he think this up and decide, I want to share this thought with the world? Tim Stanley goes on to say, if we're going down this road, I also hear that Islamists aren't very keen on bacon, so perhaps we should bombard the Iranian countryside with pig carcasses. Also, miniature bottles of gin and photos of hot guys making out, but in a, quote, men-respecting and gentle sort of way. <laughs> Well, there's huh. multiple levels on which this is absolutely <laughs> ridiculous. One is, does he think that these Islamic countries don't have access to the Internet and the proliferation of pornography that is already there? Well, the Internet is controlled in many of them, not as well as it is in China. And does he really think people in Islamic societies are not drinking alcohol like fish? Because they are. How do you know? Because I've been there. And you saw alcohol like oh, fish? Oh, yeah. Not in, not in, in, even in like Saudi Arabia? I haven't been to not Saudi, Saudi Arabia. Saudi Ar not in other places. He's talking about like full-on theocracies. All right. So Saudi Arabia. Do you remember when... Saudi when, Arabia, <laughs> Iran. Iran is a theocracy. What are our other theocracies? What, what, when SEAL Team 6, whatever Portland. they're called. Portland. Is that their name? Yeah, yes. SEAL Team 6. Yeah, well, they, they were my favorite boy band when I was a kid. <laughs> That should be a boy band. I had the action figures. So when they went in and got bin Laden, and yes. then afterwards they did that inventory of all the stuff they found in yeah. his house, yeah. it included a whole lot of pornography. He had a whole library of porn. Yeah. So apparently... He wasn't a very good Muslim. On multiple levels. I don't think. Although many people will think he's a wonderful Muslim because of how many Westerners he killed. See? We don't know. You don't know. Everyone has their different it's view. It's very confusing. So also Stephen Fry. You know who Stephen Fry is? I don't. Yeah. He's a British comedian. Yeah. He's also an actor. He's been in several You would think I should know him then. He's a movies. big guy. He's very large. Did you see uh, the new Hobbit films? I did not. The last two. He was, okay. the, he was the, in them. The master of Lake Town. Yes, he he plays the dweeb that manages Lake Town. Okay. And he and he's painted out to be a terrible character, and actually is killed when the dragon is killed. The dragon's body falls on him uh -huh, okay. while he's trying to escape with a bunch of loot. That's Stephen. Got his Fry. just desserts. Yes, uh, he also is still writing about how angry he is. At God. He's an atheist, fairly prominent atheist. When asked by the great uh, Gay Byrne on Irish television, Gay, gay Byrne? Byrne? That, gay Byrne, that doesn't sound politically correct. <laughs> no, I don't think there's hopefully a lotion for that. On oh, Irish geez. television, what he would say if God, to God if he met him, super atheist Fry had this response. I'll say, bone cancer in children, what's that about? How dare you, how dare you create a world where there is such misery that's not our fault. It's utterly, utterly evil. Why should I respect a capricious, mean-spirited, stupid God who creates a world which is so full of injustice and pain? He went on to say that he much prefers the Greek gods to the Christian God. Uh, so, And this is a story in the, the uh, London Telegraph. Saying that you prefer the Greek gods to the Christian God, Trish, Christian one is akin to screaming, I did classics at school, and is really just showing off. It's also morally corrupt because the Greek gods rather liked raping and murdering and were often immune to human pleas for compassion. Moreover, Fry's central point that a god who is all-powerful yet does nothing about suffering must be cruel is rather passe. Not only has theology dedicated itself for thousands of years to unpick that problem, but the answer to it is there in the very Bible itself. So this is actually a Christian writing in uh, the mm -hmm. Telegraph, which is kind of impressive off the bat that mm -hmm. the Telegraph is letting Christians write. So there's a, there's a rise even in London of uh, atheists are getting a little over the top. You know, sometimes the best thing you can do is let your opponent just keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> I was told once uh, there was a friend of mine who's a pretty po pr uh, prominent, pr prominent, thank you, um, <clears throat> Christian leader and, and uh, rather polarizing. And he was getting all kinds of nasty stuff said about him. And we were together one time. I said, you know, why, why don't you ever respond to your critics? He never, he famously just wouldn't respond to them. Yeah. And his, res his answer to me was kind of interesting. He said, you know, when someone throws mud on you, if you try to rub it off, you just make a bigger mess. Mm. But if you just let that mud sit for a while, yeah. it'll dry up and then just flake off by itself. Oh. And I thought that was kind of... That is interesting. Kinda, but some of these, you know, these heavy-handed critics of religion 
Dawkins and others, if you just let them keep tweeting, let them keep talking, yeah. don't get all caught in their, yeah. don't take the bait. Yeah, I think yeah. some of the let most disturbing behavior I see from Christians online is those that are trying to fight fire with Retaliation. fire. Retaliation. Exactly. Like, like, well, I'm going to be just as clever as you are mm-hmm. in insulting your beliefs. Oh, Please don't do because that. Because cleverness is really what welcomes people into the kingdom of yes, God. Yes, cleverness uh, pulls people towards Jesus. Right. Clever, witty repartee is how Jesus attracted his following. Did you know that? Well, he did have some good one-liners, <laughs> let's be honest. <laughs> but only towards uh, religious people. Right. Yeah, never towards anyone like, like, who was actually... Oh, you brood of vipers? Yeah. Right. Is that you what you're thinking about? white tomb. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. And then I read one other article. Oh, no, 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 no. No, no, no. Wait, wait. This. This is even better. Okay. So, I can't wait. So, <laughs> I hope this is not like the peeing in Germany so, story. Okay. So the Muslims, they've got problems that they got to figure out. Christians, we've got problems we got to figure out. The atheists are getting got their problems own too. crazy uncles. Iceland... Oh, yeah. I saw Iceland. This. Iceland is rejecting all of it and returning <laughs> to the Norse gods. Iceland is building the first temple to Norse gods in a thousand years. Uh, this just in from Reykjavik. 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 Icelanders will soon be able to publicly worship at a shrine to Thor. This is totally <laughs> sponsored by Marvel. <laughs> <laughs> Thor, Odin, and Frigg. Who's Frigg? Why have I never heard about Frigg? You know, I use that He's God's name favorite. in vain all the time. <laughs> what are you doing? I'm Friggin. That's when you dance like Frigg. Okay, I think we need to just get back on track. Thor, Odin, and Frigg. Why? I don't where know. You can Frigg, look it up later. Where has Frigg if been all these years? If only we had years? something where you could type in Frigg and information yeah, would come up. I, I, maybe I'll try that. Okay. Worship of the gods in Scandinavia gave way to Christianity about a thousand years ago, but a modern version of Norse paganism has been gaining popularity in Iceland. Now, Hilmar Orn Hilmarsson... Hilmar Hilmarsson. You should be reading this with your... Hilmar Orn Hilmarsson said, I don't believe anyone believes in a one-eyed man who's riding a boat on a horse. I turned Canadian. Yeah, you did. (laughs) (laughs) I don't believe anyone believes in a one-eyed man who is riding about on a horse with eight feet. Apparently, that's Frigg. (laughs) I think that was Odin. Odin is a one-eyed man? Yeah, I remember Anthony Hopkins only has a patch on one eye in the movie. Oh. I think that's. I just thought that was just a war injury, but that's actually part of his yeah. divine nature. We I, don't know. I don't. I did not we take a year know. in college to study Norse mythology. We do not okay. know. Or Hilmar Orn Hilmar Orn Hilmarson is the high priest. I think it might be Hjalmarsson. Hilmar Orn Hjalmarsson is the high priest of Asatruo Frillergig. <laughs> I don't think they, that's what it says. They really need to buy some vowels in Iceland, you know. <laughs> Asa Trur Felgid. That is a mouthful. I once bought that on sale at Ikea. <laughs> There's a lotion for that. Asa Trur Felgid is an association that promotes faith in the Norse gods. We see the stories as poetic metaphors and a manifestation of the forces of nature and human psychology. So he says they're not actually worshiping confusing. the Norse gods. <laughs> they're worshiping... Nature and human psychology. The forces of nature and human psychology. Personified <clears throat> in the stories of the Norse Yes, gods. this, yeah. so Thor, his hammer, represents your ego. And so we're going to worship it. <laughs> it doesn't even make sense. This, I think that Hilmar Orn Hilmarsson is Iceland's, uh, who's our favorite Satanist? Oh, Lucian Greaves. Lucian Greaves. Lucian Greaves. Yes, yes. Who, is the, who also wants us all to worship things that he doesn't actually believe in. He does? Right. Well, yeah, he says Satanists don't actually believe in Satan. Right. Right. He's okay. just an anti-religion. Yes, advocate. and now apparently Norse, Norseans or Asatur Feligidians don't actually believe in the Norse gods. They just worship them. Right. Is this like the ultimate relativism where we now worship religions that we don't even believe in simply as a way of rejecting the colonial religion of Christianity that we were supposed to worship? Oh, that's a good question. I, you know, in a weird way, I, f- I think this is a return to the really the essence of human religion. Yeah. So go back to when Norse mythology was actually believed, right? It, 
there's no explanation for thunder. So, well, there must be a god behind it. We'll call him Thor and blah, blah, right. blah. Right. So it, it's a way of personifying... Uh, stuff you don't know or stuff you don't understand and so now what they're saying is well we do understand human psychology we do understand natural forces but science in and of itself doesn't give us that relational right. component that we find so compelling so let's go back and actually personify so them again this, even though we know it's make believe is this more a rejection of Christianity or is it more a rejection of, of scientific atheism no I don't think it's a rejection <laughs> of scientific atheism I think it's taking scientific atheism and realizing in our pursuit of science we've lost something that is essential to our human experience which is the relational component of it that there's a will behind these things not just a force and that's what they're bringing back. So yes, it's a rejection of Christianity for sure, but I think what it is, it's an embrace of scientific naturalism with adding in the personality piece that religion can bring. But, but what are they, you know, first of all, what does their worshiping look like? And second of all, what are they expecting of those gods? Iceland's neo-pagans still celebrate the ancient sacrificial ritual of blot. What's that? It's the ancient sacrificial ritual of blot with music, reading, eating, and drinking, but nowadays leave out the slaughter of animals. Oh. So they have rituals. They have rituals. So what do they slaughter if not animals? Vegetables? Uh, it's, it's, it's the sacrificial ritual of blot, and they just don't sacrifice anything. Well, that's ridiculous. Well, that seems silly. <laughs> It's ironic. So basically, they want they want to have a big they party. They want to have something to do on they Sunday morning. Well, it's like the Sunday assembly, right? Yeah. The, the atheist church. They want something to do. But why is that important? Because we need fellowship. Because we need fellowship and, and, and we like and ritual. ritual. We want meaning. When, think about when even you if it's almost make believe almost every significant. Uh, transition in one's life, there's a ritual for. Marriage, there's a ritual for. Death, there's a ritual for. Yep. A lot of times birth with a christening or whatever, there's a ritual the for. But if you're a complete scientific atheist, there's no ritual. No rituals. So that's no why rituals. they go back to this stuff, because it's part of our human instinct that we need these... Why do we, Why is that? Well, you could argue differently in different ways. Part of it is... is you can argue that evolutionary... If you're a naturalist, you say we evolved that way right. to bring us together into groups so that we could fight off predators and be bonded together, okay. or you'd say, because God made us to long for him ah. and for higher meaning. Um, the temple will host ceremonies such as weddings and funerals. The group will also confer names to children and initiate teenagers, similar to other religious communities. They better not name any girls Frigg. <laughs> that would not go over well. <laughs> or Blot. Blot. <laughs> Honestly, are those not names of products at Ikea? <laughs> Uh, actually, in my grocery store, I think. That's a nice friggin' shelf you got there. <laughs> I, I still can't put together my Asa Tour fella gig. Well, That's what a- you need is a blot. <laughs> no, what I, what I need is an Allen wrench. <laughs> Okay, that's nuts. We got just a little more time. It's getting more aggressive. I read a story this morning that really kind of made me cranky. It's on Slate. Um, it's on Oh. And it's a response to the Jim Crow reference from the prayer breakfast. Prayer for like gig 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 gig. Yeah, when President Obama said yes. that in the past, he said, Christianity, hey, Christianity was justif- justified was used Jim to, Crow was used to justify Jim Crow. Right. So this is a, a story in Slate by Jama- Jamal Bowie. Uh, that actually says the lynching and torture of blacks in the Jim Crow South uh, weren't just acts of racism, they were religious rituals. And then he goes on to argue that for most of the century between the two reconstructions, the bulk of the white South condoned and sanctioned terrorist violence against black Americans. The bulk of the white South. I have to disagree with that the coming bulk from the deep south. Of the white Does he mean that geographically or demographically? I don't know, but it's not backed up with any research. No. Both. In a new report, the Alabama-based Equal Justice Initiative documents nearly 4,000 lynchings of black people in 12 southern states between 1877 and 1950. More than 4,000 That's a lot. lynchings. And it's by a smaller... In 12 states. In 12 states, Alabama, Arkansas, Florida, Georgia, Kentucky, Louisiana, Mississippi, North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, Texas, and Virginia. Okay, now here's where it gets interesting. These lynchings weren't just vigilante punishments. Uh, They were rituals, and specifically, they were rituals of Southern evangelicalism. Ooh. And it's then dogma of purity, literalism, and white supremacy. 
Okay. Okay. <laughs> so historian Amy mm. Louise Wood says Christianity was the primary lens through which most Southerners conceptualized and made sense of suffering and death of any sort. It would be inconceivable that they could inflict pain and torment on the bodies of black men without imagining that violence as a religious act. Laden what? with Christian symbolism and significance. Okay, whoa, whoa, whoa. Isn't There's that some like... truth in there. A little okay. piece. Well, let's back up it. for a second. Yes. He used the word evangelicalism. He did. Loosely. American evangelicalism, as we currently understand it, really did not emerge until the 1940s. Right. So if he's talking so about the 1870s to the 1950s, there may be 10 years there where the idea of modern American evangelicalism would have been understood, and it was such a minority position. Okay, so then let's just let's give him the benefit of the doubt. It can't Southern be that. Christianity. Okay, that's okay. different. Southern Christianity. Um, uh, he says, the God of the white South demanded purity. That's not true. Embodied by the white woman. That's not true. The white woman is the embodiment of purity demanded by God. Not true. You know, what would be helpful here is if he cited <laughs> some kind of source. I know. That's the problem. There's no sources on this. Uh, white Southerners would build the barrier with segregation, but when it was breached... Lynching was the way they would mend the fence no. and affirm their freedom from the moral contamination represented by blacks and black men in particular. Here, here's where he does have a leg to stand on, okay. from my understanding and study of history. And What's that is one of, the, one of the great fears that the southern states had when Lincoln was elected and there was this sense that abolition was coming for, for slaves. Was, there were two great fears. One was that freed slaves would turn around and kill the white masters who had oppressed them for centuries and right. you know done all these horrible things. And the second great fear was they were going to take they our... They wouldn't have anybody to work their farms. Well, no, not just that. They were going to take our women. And, they're going to they're yeah. take our white women. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and violate them. And this was the era in which, during the Civil War and, and Reconstruction after Civil War, when gun ownership became a huge movement in the United States, particularly in the South, because there was a sense of of paranoia that we've oppressed black people for hundreds of years. They're, They're going to kill us for it. We need right. to defend ourselves and protect our women. Well, and quite honestly, there was a lot of the white males violating the black women. Well, sure. I mean, go well. back to Jefferson and, so, you know. Farther than that. So, Payback. Right. Yeah. How many guns were in your house growing up? You don't want to know. <laughs> okay. but, but honestly, that's where, it, that's where it came from. It was Actually, a fear. Actually, I was cleaning out my dad's closet when I went to help him a few weeks ago. There were like six or seven, and like there were little handguns going back to my great-grandfather. They really? just get passed down. More guns. Yeah. Um, okay, here's a quote, Then this is interesting. Uh, the leader of the NAACP, Walter White, 1929. That's ironic. Walter White, <laughs> the leader of the NAACP, 1929. It is exceedingly doubtful if lynching could possibly exist under any other religion than Christianity. What? <laughs> no person who is familiar with the Bible-beating, acrobatic, fanatical preachers of hellfire in the South and who has seen the orgies of emotion created by them can doubt for a moment that dangerous passions are released which contribute to emotional instability and play a part in lynching. Head of the NAACP, 1929. Yeah, but here, okay. We all know, as the president said last week or two weeks ago, that, yes, people have used Christianity to justify, to justify all kinds of terrible things. But we need to remember, number one, Christianity was also used powerfully for the abolition movement and by Wilberforce to end slave trade in the, in the United Kingdom. Christianity was used powerfully by slave communities in the South for a sense of hope right. and emancipation <clears throat> and, and freedom. He mentions that. He mentions that. The so only... you can't just say Christianity was the cause of lynching when it was also the cause for the freedom of, of I'm slavery. Just, I'm trying to figure out the argument being made here that by, by Walter White in 1929 that uh, very flamboyant preaching incites a lot of emotion which and and lots of emotion play a part in extreme actions. Well, that seems to have nothing to do with Christianity and as much to do with Nazi Germany and the the oratory of Hitler and you know, I mean, good oratory in any society right. has raised people to do things both good and bad. If you're going to I think he has a point there though that if if you're in the south in 1929 what kind of oratory are you going to use? The only 
the only thing you have right. at your disposal is Christianity and preaching right. and churches and stuff. And so, yeah, I'm sure some white supremacists did use that to well, stir people up into frenzy. Well, and not only, but it, it was a lot among themselves, and they used it to justify. And again, it, it's a very sad tale, but, you know, in my own town is where Sam Bowers was from. And so... Who's Sam Bowers? Sam Bowers was the head of the Ku Klux Klan back in the 1950s oh. Oh. and 60s. And so okay. I grew up... He was in up, your town? Yeah, down the street from my house, actually. Wow. And, was and, his house white? <laughs> yes, it was. And I grew up, Did when you know? I was in seventh or eighth grade, the schools had not yet been integrated. Yeah. So I am, you know, I do very well remember what it was like, you know, in our churches or in our communities. And, and I remember when our schools were integrated and how our families felt and reacted vividly. And and I do know that those people that were involved in the KKK very much justified everything they did using the Bible, mm -hmm. and they did use religious symbols. And there, how what they said? Yeah, was there a compelling argument that you remember? Hearing? Uh, the compelling argument? No, I don't. Okay. I don't remember that because okay. I didn't attend any of the, <laughs> those things. I heard the talk. Oh, okay. I heard the talk, and I do know that members that were involved in the Ku Klux Klan went to my church. I'm going to say that <laughs> it's true, and so they didn't see any. But it wasn't. It wasn't a topic that ever came up from the pulpit. Not from the pulpit, and in fact. In fact, the church that I went to, Dr. Bob Marsh, this is a powerful story. Dr. Bob Marsh was the first person in my hometown that went to, you know, extend his hand to the black churches and say, let's stand together. And, and he, he was invited black kids to our youth group and that divided our church mm -hmm. and it was a huge, terrible thing. But the pastors that I knew in my hometown were preaching just the opposite and trying to open the minds of these mm -hmm. people at the First Baptist Church, mm -hmm. you know, in Laurel. Mm -hmm. So here's a, here's a little quiz. Yes. What state has the most registered Ku Klux Klan members? Maine. Any guesses? I have no idea. If you were to guess, what would you think? Mississippi. Texas. You ready for the correct answer? Yeah. Indiana. Indiana? Why? Indiana. Why Indiana? That's a good question. I found that out when I was at school in Ohio, very close to the Indiana border, and there was a lot of racial stuff going on, and we yeah. did some research, and sure enough, Indiana has more registered Klan members than any other state in the country. Wow. So a lot of times we make this out to just be a Southern yeah. Christian white kind of thing. And Martin Luther King Jr., when he came to Chicago, said it was the most segregated right. city he'd ever been to. Right. So this is a Northern thing, too, and it's not just for the South, although yeah, the but, crimes we often associate most happen yeah, in the but, South. Yeah, but yeah, but he closes his article by saying, even though some Christians weren't in favor of lynching, particularly African-American Christians... We're not in faith. He actually say. says that. Like, oh. Duh. <laughs> Still, we can't deny that lynching in all of its grotesque brutality was an act of religious significance justified by the Christianity of the day. That seems like a gross overgeneralization. <laughs> well, don't you think when he qualifies Christianity of that day... Of the, that well, there was a pop there was a popular form of Christianity in the white South, as you just articulated, that yeah. justified segregation, Jim Crow, and all the rest of it. Well, that doesn't mean that's what Christianity, you know, universal is affirming, as we have already talked about. There were many Christians who you know, disagreed right. with that. Okay, I just found that to be a, a disturbingly uh, unsupported, uh, overreaching article. You know what I find interesting? And, 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 and unfortunately, journalism, because it's going online, is becoming more and more like this. It's more opinionated. It's more opinion and, and, it's, factual. and it's less responsible. Unlike this podcast. Go ahead. I interrupted well, no, you. No, I, I, just in this podcast, the thing <laughs> in the stories that you have brought up, it has caused me to realize that I can sit here and say you know there is a you know huge conflict in the muslim community or and so i'm going to look at you know these big extreme events and say well that clearly is what islam right. is right but if i stop for a second and i look right. at the christian message we have the same problem clearly well that's what president obama was trying to say that got him in so yeah. much trouble and so we have so on one hand we have last week Russell Moore said, Christians didn't go along with that stuff at all. <laughs> we were all against it. And this article, all Christians went along with that stuff. They were, f 
both of them are exaggerating. Mm -hmm. We're so prone to exaggeration mm -hmm. to try to, to and make not checking our, our facts to make our tribe look better. Right. Hey, can I can I put two oh, yeah, 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 yeah. quick announcements? Sky has two quick announcements. Thank you for that. Uh, first off, on February 26th, which is coming up pretty quickly, I am doing a webinar for Compassion International. <gasps> a webinar? A webinar. It's called The Stand. They have a series. This one is with me and John Ortberg. Ooh. Is it an interactive one? I think so, yeah. I mean, there's going to be a live audience, but then obviously if you're not going to be, this is going to be in Asheville, North Carolina. Asheville, like North Carolina. That's yeah. a great so, town. Is that segregated? I hope not. <laughs> anyway, this uh, this webinar is called Pew Potatoes. What? That sounds fun. Which should have been an Pew episode. Pew Potatoes? Yeah, it should like have been. Couch is potatoes? that right. potatoes funded by the Pew Trust? No, these are <laughs> potatoes that sit in the pew. Oh, okay. <laughs> it sounds like a VeggieTales yeah. episode, it does. doesn't it? Uh, Pew Potatoes, mobilizing your community to serve and grow. It's February 26th from 1 to 2.15 Eastern time. So it's mm. free. You can sign up. Look it up online at compassion.com, uh, the stand webcast. You can look that up too. Secondly, uh, thank you guys for those of you who have signed up for my daily devotional. That's going really well. We had a big promotion for the first month of the year to get people started off the year with God. We have a new promotion coming up. Because throughout Lent, which begins February 18th. Don't ask me. I think it's February 18th, which is the day... After Mardi Gras. Right. So this podcast will be coming out Fat Tuesday. Okay. Mardi Gras. So tomorrow uh, is the beginning of Lent, and that goes through Easter. I'm going to do a series in the Daily Devotional going through the Stations of the Cross. Ooh, I can't wait for that. But for those of you who may be from Catholic backgrounds going, oh, wait a minute, that sounds awfully Catholic... Uh, pope John Paul II officially changed the Stations of the Cross for the Catholic Church when he was Pope so that all the stations now officially what? come from the gospel account. So we're going to be walking the journey oh. of Jesus from the Garden of Gethsemane to the tomb. Are you saying they, the they previously had extra biblical yes, stations? Yes, they did. Wow. Hmm. So the Pope changed all that. So we're going to walk through those throughout Lent and reflect on, on what Jesus went through in each step of the journey and how that relates to our own discipleship. If you would like to sign up for the Daily Devotional during Lent, you can do that with a special promotion code. You first What's you, that code, Sky? First, you got to go to skyjitani.com and click on the devotional button. And then, I'm going right away. And you have to enter the code LENT, L-E-N-T, and it needs to be all capitals. We had a problem last time. And Bill's looking. It was my fault, Bill, for not telling you. All caps. Why all does that caps. Be all caps. It just does. Because it's just the way because whenever are. you say the word Lent, you have to shout clearly. <laughs> Lent. Right. So you will get fifty percent off of the daily devotional during Lent if you sign up. Which is already seriously. I know cheap. it'll be a dollar. I mean, really. <laughs> so anyway, not only is that a great way to commune with God, but it helps support my ministry, and I very much appreciate that. And by ministry, do you mean children? Yes, my <laughs> ministry to my children. <laughs> Okay, <clears throat> I might be getting a little bit hazy, but it feels like the world has gone a little bit crazy. We've got crazy uncles in the atheist community. They're going nuts, and they think it's their duty to make fun of us, and so we return the favor. We can make fun of them, too, in another flavor. But I think we might be offending our Savior, because what we're really supposed to be doing is just loving them and letting the mud flake off. That kind of made <laughs> sense. <laughs> that kind, kind of, of made. made sense. That's a new quote for the T-shirt. <laughs> Phil, that kind of made sense. Okay, thanks for coming. See you next See week. You guys. Bye.